welcome to The Robust Marketer. Today we have a friend of mine, James Van Ellswick. James is the founder and CEO of Purple Leads. He joined us in Berlin at Facebook Mastery Live and was one of the, the hits of the show. People uh, still are talking about his presentation, the information he gave, how valuable it was. Uh, Purple Leads is a massive solar lead generator and James is a, an awesome personality and someone who's uh, doing some really cool things in the industry. Welcome to The Robust Marketer today. James, how you doing? Hey, how are you, Eric? Thank you for uh, chatting with me tonight. And you're calling from Israel? Yes, I am in Tel Aviv. Lovely. I've yet to be there, but I but I want to go soon. And you've been you've been to where I'm from. You've been to Victor to uh, Victoria, British Columbia. Yes, many years ago, but it's an absolutely beautiful place. Nice. Well, one of these days we'll have to have a conference out here or something. That would be a lot of fun. Um, I'm down. But uh, let's start with how we always like to start about your your marketer's hero's journey. Where what got you to where you are today? In a nutshell, where where did you start and where where are you now? Sure. Um, so I'm currently doing lead gen. I think that's one of my core focuses. And that originated because I was the guy buying leads originally. So um, I owned and operated very large call centers in the US, uh, both in Illinois and Florida. Um, and I sold things on the phone. And I had to buy leads to do this. And um, the call center business is much more difficult uh, than the affiliate world or lead gen business. But I didn't know that then. And um, I was going through the process of selling and just realized that my main expense was my leads. So I had to, or I got into the idea of, okay, I'm gonna generate my own leads so I have quality and I'm not beholden to uh, lead generators. And once I got into it, I really liked it. I started generating quite a bit of leads, mainly on television and radio. Um, and then I was generating so many leads, I figured to offset costs and actually turn a profit, I would sell to other call centers. And it was the first time I got a kind of taste of monetizing my marketing besides turning it into deals. And um, when my last call center started to do real poorly, it was very difficult because in call centers, you don't even break even for a year, year and a half. You know, it's like the complete opposite of affiliate marketing. Um, I decided I was going to be done with the call center thing and just do the lead generation side. So um, I closed down the call centers, the remaining business, I moved to a call center in the Dominican Republic to handle. And then um, I decided I want to take some free time, travel, and just kind of learn how to generate leads. Uh, so I started working on generating uh, student loan consolidation leads on Facebook um, and was also traveling. I moved to South America. I lived in Medellin, uh, Colombia. I lived in Buenos Aires, Argentina. Just enjoyed myself, learned Spanish, studied jujitsu, ate food, had fun. And then um, I got turned on to STM from just trying to find information and learn how to market. And I went to the London meetup and uh, there I really would for the first time met like affiliates and people that were really making money. And I just saw some of the richest dumb people that I had ever met. You know, I was just like, wow, you have all these people that are really not doing much, but they're making a bunch of money. And I just thought that the whole industry was kind of soft because uh, it didn't conform to like, you know, usual business principles, but there was just a lot of money there uh, and a lot of, of quick money. So I just decided to become a part of it. Um, just started working at that, testing, losing, testing, losing, and um, finally kind of started to figure some things out on natives. Um, and then I uh, joined forces with uh, my current partner, Daniel Yavor, and uh, we opened the office here in Israel. And um, we've been generating a lot of solar leads as well as a lot of other leads, but mainly solar leads for almost three years now. Um, and that's just been like a really fun journey. It gave me the chance to spend money on natives and learn, spend money on Facebook and learn, spend money on Google and learn. So it's given me a chance to really kind of build out my uh, marketing knowledge. So it's been a blast. It's, I imagine it's, it's helpful to pick a trend that is, that's like, it's not going anywhere. You know, it's gonna evolve and it's gonna change, but it's like this trend towards alternative energy is, yes. is going to continue. So it's something you can ride and something you can grow with, it seems like. Yes. What I would mean, you like, I was gonna say, what would you say is like the state of solar now? Like I, I you know, we're all, we're always in this business where people who are, who want to jump onto trends, they're always too late. You know, they're always, but but I, you know, or a little bit too late. There's still there's still I'm sure getting you know that you can still probably jump into it to some extent. But what would you say is the state of solar currently for yeah, people looking to get into it? Yeah, it's actually growing, believe it or not, because. Solar has been limited to the states that had the best benefits for solar installations. So everybody's been marketing to California and Arizona and New Jersey, 
But as the laws have changed, solar has now opened up in other states. So it's almost fresh there, like they've never seen the ads. So if I advertise now in Pennsylvania or Oregon or Florida, they've never seen my ads. So the ads that were working a year ago that are completely burnt out in California are brand new. So this has been fantastic. And I think that the bigger play is uh, the thing that holds people back on the solar installation side as far as businesses is that not all states will reimburse you for the extra energy you generate. And that you this put makes back into live- the grid. Correct. Yeah. Correct. So the, the idea is that you, you get enough energy to fuel your house, the extra energy you sell back to the power company and they utilize it. Um, but what's going to happen now is, and what will make it be able to be 50 states, is now there's going to be the energy battery packs. So now in every state, it's going to make sense to do solar because now when you have extra power, you can store it and use it. So I think in a year and a half, we're going to see solar go nationwide. Um, and that's just on the U.S. front. Now, the yeah. state of solar in other countries is expanding. We generate leads for solar in France, Germany, Italy, Australia, Belgium. Uh, it's, it's really been popping up anywhere. Uh, and it's fun to scale a vertical to another geo because really the things that have been working in the U.S. usually translate pretty quickly to the uh, other geos. Right now, France is super hot. You know, we do a ton of volume every day in France. Um, and it's, it's just been a, it's been a great spot for us. That's super. And literally, you're just translating over your landing pages. There's no cultural nuances you're having to figure out. It's like people want this trend and, and you can serve it up to them. Yeah, it's like there's it's minor minor tweaks based on like, OK, what are the government benefits? Uh, and things of this nature, but it almost always works because the cost per click is almost always cheaper outside the United States uh, and the payouts are quite good. So it it, it kind of, even if you have to make the ads a little less sexy than the United States, because there aren't quite the government benefits, it still backs out really nice. Is is the reason that some states don't accept power back into the grid as a bonus, is that a political issue or is that a technological issue? Is the the grid set up to handle this uh, currently without any, any big changes? Yeah, so I mean, look, by no means am I a solar uh, expert. expert. Yeah, yeah, but it seems it seems pretty power company driven. Like some people want to participate, some people don't. Uh, And the size of the subsidies based on the state. So I would say it's more political. Yeah. Um, Yeah, some have financing, some don't. So I don't get too deep into it. I just look at payouts and costs. Nice. That's awesome. I just read an article I was telling you earlier that Saudi Arabia is starting to to do this. And I'm sure this is happening all over the world, but they got a lot of sun in, in Saudi Arabia. So. Sounds like it could yes. be a good opportunity there. So so people looking to get into it, just keep your ear to the ground, find out the places where it's happening, uh, where where there are the best incentives and, and potentially focus on those, I'd say. Yeah, listen, at, at, at Purple Leads, on our network side, we have offers for so many different geos, different states that um, you know people just need to ask. You know what I mean? There's so many different new opportunities outside of California and Arizona and these other ones, it's there. We have the offers, France and everywhere else. So it's uh, it's, it's pretty plug and play at this point. That's awesome. Um, so, okay, cool. So solar is, is, is what you guys are focused on, but I know that you're also focused really heavily in your business on training methods. This is one of the reasons that, that we're trying to work together, that I'm so keen on working with you is you've got, you, you've got these systems that you, that you use to uh, to, to scale your campaigns and also to train your media buyers internally. You seem like a very sort of systems oriented person. So can you talk a little bit about how you've developed, you know, your systems, how you think about advertising when it comes to, when it comes to these things? Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Systems are my life, especially when it comes to business. Um, you know, with call centers, it is once you get over like 80 agents, you know, they say there's the rule of eight to 80. Uh, scaling a, a call center above 80 salespeople, if you don't have the proper systems in place, you have 80 people on the phone saying whatever they want, however they want. And optimizing a call center is the same as optimizing media buyers or optimizing campaigns or anything. You know, it's, it's basically if you can't uh, measure, you can't manage. So step one is I just measure the performance of everything. I measure the output and, and profit per media buyer, uh, just like I used to measure the output and profit per uh, salesperson. And then I create systems. Um, I've always believed that like with employees, um, unless they're management, if they have to think for themselves, like I failed, like I can't expect them to make the right decisions. My job is to make the decisions for the company. My managers make the next level of thinking and the people that are getting paid to execute should have a low level of thought process. They should really just execute at a high level, kind of free them up from that. Yeah. So um, I make everything systematic. I don't believe in any media buying based on gut or feel. The only thing that I believe uh, involves gut or feel is creatives. 
when you write ad copy or you write images, that's the only time, or maybe like you're picking an audience that you have a thought, I have a gut feel this is going to work, but then it's quickly uh, put into the, the math formula, then it's quickly tested. So I just have instructions for everything I do. If it's testing images, there are rules. If it's testing audiences, there are rules. If it's scaling, there are rules. Uh, so that everything happens systematically because now uh, once you get a bunch of media buyers buying media, if they're all just kind of doing it their own way, uh, it's very difficult to troubleshoot and pinpoint when their campaigns go sideways. So we approach it very systematically here so we can have some uh, predictability because there's so much variability on the Facebook side. You know, it's an auction-based system. And on the buyer side, since we sell directly to retail, it's a lot of variable. So it's important for me to optimize and stabilize the uh, labor force so we can have a, a solid yield. That's really interesting. So. You know, yeah, with Facebook changing all the time as well, you know, you don't the thing that worked for you yesterday isn't necessarily going to be the thing that drives your campaign forward. So when we talk about testing, let's first of all mention so the Facebook Masterclass uh, will have launched by the time this podcast comes out, which is great. James is contributing a module on testing. It's called Stop Guessing, uh, and it's it's his testing methods that save him, him millions, which is really cool. So talk about those a little bit. Like, are they, are they things that are very difficult to implement? Are they like, I imagine they're rigorous. Um, but, but, but the baseline point of testing is to make sure that you know, when you do something and, and you have an action that it was from the thing that you did. It's basically just a, a cause and effect type type relationship that you're trying to prove. Yes. So my thing with testing is I want to test as cheaply as possible because it's a necessity to test. So it's important to organize the testing in a flow that's as cheap as possible. Um, and the second thing is you need to test until the results are definitive so you can have confidence in your scale. If you, if you don't have a sound foundation of testing and you know everything is correct, then you just can't pull the trigger on big budgets with uh, peace of mind. So the key thing, and I'll give like a quick example here, if I have to test a landing page and I have to test audiences per se, um, and I need to test images. Well, it's important to me to just complete the image test perfectly because I wanna get the clicks as cheap as possible so that when I test the audience or the landing page, let's say I'm gonna use $50 to test an audience. If I can get the clicks down to 50 cents, I have 100 clicks worth of testing. If I didn't do a nice job testing images and I rush, now my clicks are a dollar and I'm buying a lot less data for my money. So it's, it's, it's about having a systematic approach to testing everything in order, being disciplined, and I think also not scaling tests. I think very often media buyers, especially in the beginning, they set up a test, it's going nice, the test actually succeeds, and they don't turn the test off, and they kind of just try to scale that thing up, and then maybe, because it's making money, and this and that, but I don't, uh, I don't do it this way. I test everything in, in a specific pattern, so when it's time to like hit the gas, I don't even need to look in it. I test until I have full belief in the components so I can scale with, you know, with abandon. And then you literally start it. You, you won't try to like the last test that works best. You don't just take that and push budget to it. You will then copy that maybe and start fresh. And yeah, I feel like it's some type of uh, certain level of discipline that I, I, I don't know. I don't even know if it's the right thing. But I just feel like it's important when I train media buyers to instill in them the idea to not fall in love with the little petty things like a winning test. Otherwise, it just breaks the system because now you're scaling a winner uh, as opposed to following the system and really scaling. So now the results are kind of skewed. There's like I, I try to instill in them and myself a certain level of discipline. When a test is completed, we turn it off and then we hit phase number two. And it's hard to have that discipline because you're making money on it. But you can't, if you don't turn it off and you don't discipline yourself, you lose sight of like the big picture, which is it's just a step until the big scale. This is, yeah, this is really interesting. I think it's a theme that I'm noticing across all of the things that we're doing with Facebook right now. Like uh, I'm, I'm actually someone who has, I've used Facebook for user acquisition. I've used it um, in a few other places and I, and I didn't have the rigor. I didn't have the, the discipline probably. Uh, and I had some good results. That's the thing is you, you get these good results. Facebook is such an amazing advertising system. Even without the discipline, you can get some decent results. You can get some wins. But the big the difference between the people that maybe spend, you know, a hundred bucks a day or even a thousand bucks a day and, and the people that spend twenty thousand bucks a day is that rigor and that discipline. So for people that really want to take shit to the next level, I think these systems are super important to consider. That's obviously what we're gonna be putting forward in the masterclass. 
uh, when it comes to to your to, to your module as well as all the modules we're producing and all the the main coursework. So I think I think that's that's really cool. It's really clarifying in my head like what we're bringing to the marketplace here, which is that like next level of of thinking about Facebook because the the, the entry level shit gets you through the door. It it it, it kind of works, which is which is deceptive. Yes. Yeah, no, this is the next level thing, uh, really. There, there are certain things that go from being good at something to being excellent. And I hate to say it in that sense because I don't like to ever be calling myself excellent or great at anything. But I think there are certain things that really differentiate. There's like a little fine tuning that makes things have a lot of scale or a lot of profit or decreased costs. But they're just little steps in the beginning. And I think that when they're implemented, the guy who's doing 1K or 1500 a day these types of little things build up to get you to the 5k or the 10k a day because you are always constantly cutting your testing costs which i don't think people think about because they always say okay what i make today i made 2k well you know if you hadn't spent 600 bucks on testing you would have made 2600 but you don't know how to test right or you forgot to turn things off or whatever so i think that uh, these overlooked things are what take people from really from like 500 to 1500 days uh, to 5K plus is the, the insertion of these type of testing methods uh, because it allows you to not have like scales that misfire. Like you go ahead, you scale and the leads are too expensive. You avoid all of that error making, you avoid excessive test costs. So by the time that you step on the gas, it's ready to go, it gives you what you want, you can count on it and, and you end up getting Facebook to pump out the most profit. That's uh, that's really interesting. This And this it echoes, you know, really what you talked about at FBML as well with uh, with the, you know, checking your parachute, making sure your ducks are in a row, essentially, before, before you hit that gas. And I could see it being hugely beneficial uh, to our audience, especially. So um, dis let's just talk about discipline for a second. You, you've talked a lot about discipline. Uh, I know personally in our conversations, you're someone who seems to have a lot of personal discipline uh, in, in some ways. I'm sure that I'm sure it ebbs and flows at times, but you're someone who's sort of like been you you've kind of transformed your life in some ways through discipline can you talk about that at all yeah for sure so like you know majority of my life well maybe not majority anymore but i was just really a wild man you know i've always been kind of freewheeling fast talking quick thinking and that really kind of pushed me along the road pretty well um, and then i guess as i've gotten older i just realized there were times to kind of curtail that uh tighten up and discipline and i just saw like real increased performance and I started to feel this kind of uh, personal satisfaction or pleasure in, exi in exhibiting discipline. Um, I think like the two things that I would say like the last 10 years of my life that I'm the most happy that I found, you know, was discipline and patience. Because I feel like when you start to establish discipline and you start to have patience, the really big stuff starts to happen. You know, when, when you're just pushing quickly, you can make little bursts happen, but they don't become, per, you know, uh, consistent and systematic, you know? So um, at one point I was like super overweight, partying all the time, drinking all the time. And I woke up one day uh, and I just said, look like enough, I'm not gonna do this anymore. So I just completely quit drinking. I went on a very regimented intermittent fasting diet, which I still adhere to. I started exercising four days a week. I started doing yoga and it, it, it all happened at the same time. And every time I took like one little step of I got up and I went to the gym or I didn't eat bullshit at, you know, 10 in the morning. It just kind of kept building and feeling better and better until it became habit. And now it's just uh, a, a huge part of my life. And it's been able to really create a lot of time and efficiency for me. So I really believe in discipline. In patience. your personal and professional life, it sounds like, which is which is really cool. And I think this is like a, a really important story for our audience because we, you know, I imagine our audience is a lot of younger performance marketers and there's a lot of like, there are very little boundaries in the life of a performance marketer. You're making good money quite often. So spending is something, your hours are whatever they want you to be. You know, you just have to like look at a computer all day basically. Uh, yeah. And so I feel like that, that this, this sort of evolution that you've gone through is something um, that a lot of people are looking for. And at the same time, because we're sort of outside the box thinkers and we're outside of the box workers, we know that like personal betterment is you know at our core, we're not just slaving away at a corporate job and and punching the clock kind of thing. These these are people that are uh, that are on that journey. I think that journey towards like self betterment. So I feel like your story is something that will resonate a lot with people. Yeah, th this is a big thing for me. I think that the there was a point that I realized that I make my money with my brain. Like at the end of the day, my cash comes from my thinking, and I just decided to alleviate 
as much thinking as possible from my day. Um, and our brain does it automatically. Like when we take a look at like brands or logos, when we see Starbucks or McDonald's, we don't read Starbucks or McDonald's. Our brain automatically takes the information in, recognizes it and functions off of it. So I started to just make a, a, a personal iteration or plan. I started wearing the same thing every day, take away that decision making, started to systemize what time I ate and where I go and my regimen and my schedule so that the, the, the bulk of my brain power, which is how I make my money, could be focused on making money as opposed to all these little tiny decisions throughout the day. That were so relevant to you in the long run. Exactly, exactly. Like the clothes thing. You know, it's like I had tons, I, I used to work for a law firm. I had tons of suits and badass clothes, you know, all of this Louis Vuitton and Ferragamo and all of this type of stuff. And I realized that at the end of the day, I only wore five outfits. I had like five outfits that were like my go-to outfits, but I had a closet full of stuff and I would wake up and I would have like 30 minutes of trying to decide how to do this. And I was like, what a waste of brain power, <laughs> you know? And I just got rid of all of this. So when I hit my flow, I'm going to the same gym, same yoga studio, same places to eat. So that all I got to do is kind of glide through life and think to make money. Um, and I think also too, a lot of affiliates have got onto it of getting virtual assistants. I outsourced my entire life and every task years ago. Like I, anything, it's really an arbitrage for me. Like I know that my time is worth X amount of dollars. So anything that I can pay someone to do in my life for a smaller amount of money, I just do it. You know, I outsource every function of my life so I can just uh, work, figure yeah. out how to make money and enjoy time with my uh, my lady, you know. So. My, my wife was just telling me about a study that, that showed this, that you, you actually uh, get more pleasure from paying someone to do something you don't want to do than buying a material good of the same value, essentially like a new shirt yeah, or something. Sure. It's just like, and, sure. and, and it's, and it's good for the economy and it, you know, it's all over totally. kind of a good thing. So I, I it, one of the things, sorry, go ahead. Well, I, I think what it is too is, is that not only do I like paying someone to do all the different assets or do all the different things I need to get done, but I like to pay people to do it better than myself because I really see myself kind of like as a business you know, because my time is optimized to make money. So if I have people that are superior at these type of things than I am, my overall uh, influence to the world or my overall output as a, as, a, as a business kind of are increased. So it's having people that are better at these things than me do all of the things. So my overall presentation to the world is a lot better. It reminds me of the Jay-Z song, I'm not a businessman. I'm a, I'm a business, business man. man. Absolutely. You know? <laughs> Absolutely. Pretty Absolutely. much, pretty much the affiliate life, and also what you're speaking. This is something that came to mind that I that I that come that I comes back to me a, a lot is uh, a book by David Lynch, uh, the filmmaker, one of my favorite filmmakers. He wrote a book because he's a uh, he's really big into transcendental meditation, uh, right. and so he wrote a book called Catch, Catching the Big Fish, and it's exactly okay. kind of what you spoke to about earlier, which is you know you live this life where you you reach for the mouth pleasure of a of a McDonald's cheeseburger or something you reach for a frappuccino all these things are these these little wins for yourself these little dopamine hits and right now for yeah. me a lot of that is the is the phone and the the Instagram likes like i'm really yes. i'm right now i'm kind of personally caught in that a little bit uh, and so we kind of are going for these little fish all the time that give us these little wins that are in the long run hollow. And, and when you're able to have some discipline over those things, you're able to focus on the big fish. And those are the things that, that yes. really drive the peak experiences in life, which is kind of what yes. we're after. Yeah, th this is a huge point. And I don't even know if you know this or not, but I basically, no one has my phone number except my wife. Not one person on earth. Like I don't receive any phone calls because I don't want my experience, I don't want my life interrupted. Like I wanna have my time on my terms. So I have no notifications for Skype, email, Instagram, Facebook, phone, text, WhatsApp. So my phone is basically useless until I decide to engage the outside world. So my day is never interrupted. I, I'm always proactively contacting as opposed to being contacted. And I think that's because I also realize, probably because I'm getting older, is that you know if time is a currency, which frankly it is, um, the only currency, baby. Yeah, and it's not it's not renewable. Yeah. So it has a higher value than cash. So when it comes to the outsourcing portion, an hour of my time in this limited eighty, hopefully a hundred year life, what is the value of this? I'd rather have the time, and that's really what the money should be for: is to create more time, so we can either have more time to work on our business, experience our life, and just really be present. I mean, I just went away to Thailand for a week and um, I turned it all off for seven days. No screen, no laptop, no iPhone, no social, 
no social media, no email, no Skype, WhatsApp, nothing. I just walked away from it. Uh, and my brain felt very refreshed and reflective. And I had high value thinking again, as opposed to like reactive, I'm going to respond to an email. I had really nice proactive thoughts on how to guide my business and how to adjust things. I found solutions to problems that have been kind of uh, spinning around for me with a while. But once I'd given it this time to kind of uh, blossom, it was amazing the power my brain had when it wasn't distracted by, uh, you know, reactive life, you know. And in the background, this is something that's, and this is something that I find interesting as well, is that ability to overcome obstacles and solve problems when you're not grinding away on them necessarily, when you're not just yes. like, oh, I got it, like when you're not laying awake at night and thinking about them, when you're actually yes. able to go do a sport or go for a bike or do something and have your brain sort of figuring it out in the background. Exactly, exactly. I think we have a really strong internal algorithm. I think we have a subconscious algorithm and I think we have a conscious algorithm. And I think the subconscious is so much stronger because our rational brain and our ego thinking doesn't get in the way. And sometimes when we're just quiet, that algorithm spits out the, the answers that we're looking for if, if you let it. Very cool. So so I love all this esoteric stuff, but back to the real algorithm that yeah, you sorry care about. No, I, I love it. Sorry. I love it. Uh, that's my name on the STM forum, Esoteric. I, I love this shit. So really? um, let's just talk a little bit about the, you know, one thing that, that, that you know, we're at, at iStack Training, we're teaching all white hat tactics. We, we think that the future is, is with working with Facebook on these things. Let's just talk a little bit about what's happening, what you see happening in the landscape. Last week or two weeks ago now, uh, Facebook actually put out this article that was, you know, calling out cloakers, calling out black hat. I see that as a big step towards them. Uh, you know, sort of engaging in that war. They're never going to win it, but it's but it seems like the the tide has turned sort of against the black hat way of thinking. What are your thoughts on that? Look, I, I've seen a lot of people make a lot of money on black hat, and when I came into the industry and I kind of saw both sides, I never took any moral stance on it one way or another. It's a um, game. Yeah, just it is what it is. But the business model of it for me. Uh, to always be as good as my last dollar and 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 always be as good as like the day before because maybe tomorrow the whole thing is broken. I just couldn't deal with that idea of losing accounts and going through this kind of drama. Um, and I see it as a, as, a, as a business model for some, but as time has gone on in the industry, I've seen a lot more people having problems with this. Uh, it's just become more difficult and more difficult. And I've never really seen Facebook just straight up just call it out. There's always like mm -hmm. the rumors and murmurs of like, oh, you know, you know, they know what's going on. They make a lot of money off of it and this is going to happen or that's going to happen. But, you know, a few weeks ago, like on the Facebook blog, you know, they straight up talked about using artificial intelligence to stop cloakers. And I've never seen the word cloaker uh, like in any type of official publication or whatever. Um, so, you know, and I think Facebook is smart. You know, when they put their AI on something, I think that... Um, it's probably going to be pretty efficient. So for me, when I when I had to make my choice of which way to go, and I went with White Hat, it was for a longevity point of view, um, because I feel like maybe even less ROI, not really always less ROI, but let's even say potentially less ROI. Uh, I think there's just higher profit if you have a more sustainable business, and I'm just all about the money. You know, I really look at the long term cash. How will I make more money over a year as opposed to a week? And if I can build something that's sustainable, then, and, and also if you can tell with my systems and everything else, I like things that are stable and sustainable that I don't need to think about. That's truly a business, is a machine that makes you money when you're not having to drive it. You know, when they, when, when, it, when it knows to do on its own and everybody can handle things on their own, there are no emergencies and it's just smooth. You know, to me, that's a business. That's something you can sell or something you can feel uh, really stable with. And I just never felt that stability was there um with with the black hat side it's a lot of small fish it's it can be big i'm sure, I'm sure i'm sure it can be quite big fish on a day-to-day -day basis but they're always escaping you and it's that that sort of perpetual game i i just don't have the personality or the 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 heart to handle it i think it's a young man's game you know what i mean like maybe when i was younger i could have handled it but at this point it's just like i i love white hat you know you can make extreme amounts of money um, and look, even for black hat guys, like, look, you, you, you net 20K, 30K in a day, it's a sick number. And yeah. when you do it on the white hat side, it, 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 you potentially you can do it for a bunch of days. Like there was a kid yesterday that I saw that did like 360K in revenue, white hat. 
e-commerce e-commerce i saw that on tim bird's group that was incredible that post and like i don't i don't know right but in like the history of black hat how many people did 360k in a day probably not that many but now the thing is is this kid is probably still going to do at least 250 a day for another five to seven days until his campaigns burn out let's say right yeah. if you have that opportunity to do something like this and you can make it continue even if the stuff fades down to a hundred a day you, you just don't really have that opportunity, I don't think, on the other side. So I just think White Hat is where the biggest, uh, really where the biggest money is at. If, if, you, if you break through that plateau, you know, because I don't know, the, the opportunity for scale, you need stability. To grow profit margins that big, you need to have scale. In order to have scale, you need to have access to a lot of traffic. In order to have a lot, access to a lot of traffic, it's, it's almost necessary to do White Hat, I think, you know? Yeah, it's where the big fish are. Yes. Nice. So one of the things, we'll just talk briefly about this. You, so, you know, being a white hat advertiser, you maintain a really uh, close relationship with Facebook. Uh, and, and your talk was actually uh, specifically at FBML was specifically about, um, you know, your how a talk with your Facebook rep saved you, was it a lot of money, basically? Sure. Un- it increased the ROI so much in one day, it like changed the whole game for me. And that one was nugget. about your bid to budget ratio, which which is something yeah. that people can check out in, in the FBML recordings. But what was talk a little bit about your more recent uh, discussion with them, where they talked about some of the new things coming down the pipe. And you don't need to go into too much detail on these new products because we'll leave that to people to to kind of discover. But what did sure. what did these new products speak to you about what their fo- what Facebook's focus is going forward? Yeah, that's that's a good way to word it. So um, I'm very fortunate by being here in Tel Aviv. Like literally the Facebook office is two blocks away. So I get invited to all of their different things, product launches, interviews on products, talking to engineers, as well as having a great relationship with my rep and people to help me run the campaign. So we lean on this to the maximum, you know, and what's interesting is, is I've been able to get a lot of insight into what their goals are and they're not always what we would think. Um, And I would say that right now, you know, for me as a CPA marketer, it's all about cost per conversion and profit. That's it. I only care about the cash at the end of the day. Whereas when I see them design a lot of their products, um, they're concerned also about pacing. I don't know why. Um, and now also uh, lifetime value of customers. So they are really, yeah, oh, that's they're smart. really updating things now or making products to allow you to target um, lifetime value of customers. You know, they launched a little bit ago um, value-based lookalikes where you can upload a bunch of converters and at different prices. Let's say you have leads of different values. One is 10, 20, 30. You include this in the lookalike and they'll build custom lookalikes based on this, this lifetime value of a customer. Now, right in the campaigns very soon, you'll be able to build campaigns with this LTV targeting that will understand when you post back the currency, you'll be able to, or it will optimize in real time for people that spend more money per conversion as opposed to a conversion, and, and just a regular conversion. So they're really, yeah, they're really thinking about the long term for us. Um, and I think they're putting a lot of efforts into e-commerce and lead generation um, because they see that there's a lot of action there. I think, I, think I, I get the feeling that Facebook feels a lot better or, or more, the, the people that work there feel very satisfied working with say, CPA people because it's measurable. Um, and a lot of the new products are, yeah. are built uh, for us. Uh, there's also some cool stuff they have now. They'll be coming out with a, a ad budget allocation. So if you have a campaign with multiple ad budgets, you'll be able to set a budget at the campaign level and it'll allocate the spend to the best performing ad sets, which will be like a complete new restructure. Yeah. Nice. They're coming out with, um, this is a great one. You'll be able to set up ad sets and it will change the ad copy to the language of the IP. And you can do it up to like five five languages or the browser, yeah. So basically I can run an ad, show it worldwide or show it to five separate countries and it will automatically translate the uh, ad copy for me. Do you trust that? Mm, not really. I don't trust like, anything like until I try it. No, I don't. Yeah, until you test it. I don't trust anything until I test it. And also, too, like they said it pretty clearly as well. And I'm gonna get access to a bunch of these betas. I just haven't asked this week because I want to play with them. But they said, look, we're giving you these betas, but they may not make it. Like they may be good, they may not. Like we're we're launching these things. Um, 
but they may never make it to the marketplace. And that's why, like, I think what's their whole thing about go fast and break things or whatever. Yeah. You know, they think things up, they launch it and maybe it works, maybe it doesn't. Um, but at, at the baseline, you can see where their uh, thought process is and, and, and efforts for us is to, uh, you know, make, make the whole system work better for us, you know, make everything more effective for lead generators and for e-commerce guys. So it, it, that's why I think if you do Facebook white hat, if you're just given a lot of tools and support for them uh, to do, you know, to make money like we want to make it with, with their help. I've also heard them say, uh, you know, like it, Black Hat is one of those things they know exists. They don't want it. But I've also heard them say sort of off the record at times, like, if hey, if you're doing this much on Black Hat, like, come, you have the skills to do this in White Hat, too. And, like, they're not going to maybe say that on the record, and maybe I shouldn't say it on the podcast, but... They, they, there's almost like a, like a black hat rehabs, you know, maybe that's what our course is. Maybe that's what, maybe that's what we'll do with the course is, uh, is, is rehab people over to the white hat because it is fully possible. If you have the skills to be a black hat, you can be a white hat. For sure. Like it's, it's a, just, it's a completely different game. I mean, like I, I really think that you got guys that are great white hat guys that would crush black hat, great black hat guys that would crush white hat. Like if yeah. you're someone who likes to solve problems and fix things, you're going to be a great media buyer. You just have a different skill set. You know, we have to optimize traffic because we have lower ROI, and they have to optimize farms or cloakers because they have a different uh, a different problem. You know, I, I can tell you this: I went to a mastermind in um, in Berlin, and it was really like a white hat mastermind. But I would say 50% of the guys there were black hat more, and it was because they really wanted to switch to something else because they feel like it's not stable. But I don't think anybody's ever shown them stuff that can make as much money or they don't see it. But I, I really, I, I can tell you, I think it's a fallacy. I think there's tons of money in um, in White Hat, but I think it's a learning curve as well, but a fast one, especially like with the level of materials that are out there now, you can learn White Hat super fast. Um, and I, I think we will see a lot of guys transition, you know, um, as time goes on, especially if Facebook clamps down with AI and stuff. Um, I yeah. think that you're gonna see a lot of people switch over. I think that's probably the trend that, that I see as well. So let's let's j jump gears here for a second here. So you you jumped onto the stage uh, at FBML, blew everyone away, went super well. And since then, the the amount of and, and you're interested in teaching, which is why we're working together on a few things. We're working on this acceleration module. You're going to come back to Bangkok to for uh, FBML Asia uh, with a new speech there. Uh, we're going to be working on a top secret course coming up, which we'll talk a little bit after. Uh, about, but um, what are what are the top three questions that you're, because people are reaching out to you now is what I'm trying to say. People are, are actually reaching out to you quite a bit more after this, after your exposure at FBML. What are the top three questions that you're getting from people uh, about, about your speech and just about media buying in general? Man, people are smart. You know, like um, this says, I'm a pretty much behind the scene guys. I was, I, I was never really out there in the affiliate world that much. So now I've had like a lot more exposure to affiliates and um, they're smart, man. The questions that they've been asking me are really uh, excellent. The guys that were at FBML uh, that followed up on this have been really uh, pretty high level in their thinking. Um, and I, I would say most of the questions come back to the whole manual bidding thing, amounts, um, you know, how much to bid, how much budget, what's the ratio, uh, audience overlap, um, stuff that were really pertinent to the, to the talk. Uh, and, and stuff that I, mm -hmm. yeah. Nuanced Real questions. Nuanced questions. Nuanced questions. And, and I, I don't really understand why there's like super uh, confusion about it. And I, I guess this goes back to what I was saying earlier about testing. Like I just hate guessing. I hate confusion. Like I just test till I know. Um, and I've tried to impart that to people and just say, look, test it. Find out. Do it yourself. Here's my idea, but maybe my idea doesn't work right for you. Do it yourself. So a lot of it has been about um, how to test without having audience overlap or auction overlap in ad sets, um, size of audiences, uh, size of bids, size of budgets, a lot of really good questions. I've been impressed by what people have going on. Like there are people making money. Like I, I, I definitely don't think that FBML um, is, is, you know, it's definitely not a bunch of noobs. The questions were legit. And people are like making money there. I haven't talked to a lot of people or really anybody that's spending like 20, 50 bucks a day. And like, Hey, why is it not converting? Mm -hmm. It's all guys that are spending some real money. They've been doing this, they get it. And they're just looking for the tweaks to really kind of amp up their game and step on the gas a little bit. 
um, maybe verify some of the thoughts they've had, catch a fresh look at a few things. Uh, but it's been fun. I've learned some things as well, man. Some of the e-commerce guys have been really helpful. So it's been super fun to talk to some people over there. Nice. Um, yeah, it's funny that we have a, a quote from someone who, who talked to us uh, via support who thanked us for taking their spend essentially from, I think it was $1,500 a day up to over like 20 grand a day. And it was all about manual bidding, which is something that you spoke quite a lot about, which is Dude, something that I, I, think got it, I, I think it intimidates people. I think it, I think manual bidding sort of like intimidates people. They'd rather just sort of leave it up to Facebook. But in your experience, that's not the best way to go about things. No, like here's the thing. And, and I'll just be super clear about it. So you got two types of bids. You got manual bidding, you got automatic bidding. Okay. When you're speaking to the Facebook algorithm, you tell you, tell it what you want to do. It, it is two choices. It has how fast it's going to spend your budget as a priority, which is the pacing issue or the cost per lead. When you set it on automatic, you're telling Facebook, spend my money. That's my priority. Spend it. Not that it wants to spend it expensively, but your goal is just to spend the money. Whereas when you set it on manual bidding, your goal is the cost per lead. So unless you have a super high ROI vertical and you run uh, and you want to run automatic to make it just go fast, that's one thing. But if you care about the cost per lead, you don't want to give Facebook the wrong instructions. You want to tell Facebook, my goal is to keep the cost in line. Um, and I think the thing that, uh, about manual bidding is and maybe one of the reasons that I really like it is my real foundation knowledge of media buying comes from natives, which is manual. So I prefer to control my own bids. The, the, the more that I have to leave thinking up to an algorithm, the more that I have to depend on something that breaks or depend on something that I don't necessarily understand how it works. So in my mind, it creates a new variable that um, I don't have control over and I don't like that. So manual bidding really gives you uh, more control over your destiny, if you will. Um, and and I, I greatly prefer that. That makes sense. Now, you perfectly segued into it. So let's talk a little bit about Native. Native, you know, you're a Facebook ad expert, but I feel like part of you, like part of your heart is really with Native advertising. Uh, ex explain that a little bit. Explain, you know, where it came from and, and what, what you hope to do with it in the future. Yeah, like my first big days were on Natives. You know what I'm saying? Like my first 20K or my first 30K or were on Natives. Um, and Was I, that in solar or something else? That was solar. That was solar. solar. Yeah, and I mean, I, I bought a lot of traffic on Gemini, Taboola, Outbrain, Rev Content, MGID. Um, and I, I really think that the foundation building blocks and knowledge that I have of media buying comes from natives um, because it's manual. So I had to learn and understand and have like the full responsibility to make things make money. There wasn't just setting it up and letting the pixel do the work. Um, and the basic principles of the CPM and CPC versus CPC, uh, I, I think it's important. Like here, when I'm training media buyers in the office, I make them do natives first. Because like, mm. I don't want them to just, um, I'll give the example like this. I'd rather have someone I'm teaching to learn how to drive a car. They learn on stick and then they get automatic, but they should at least understand how the function works. And if you buy yeah. on natives, if you're good at buying on natives, the transition to Facebook is very easy because you already have the building blocks where when they go backwards and they learn Facebook first and they're used to just optimizing for images, test audience, set up, let conversion pixel do the work, they're not worth anything on natives. So um, th this is a big thing for me with natives. I like the fact that it has like a basic building blocks, also scaling and predictability. You know, on Facebook, you take a budget from 1K to 10K, uh, you're just going to completely thrash ROI normally. Um, where on natives, you find publishers that work and you turn up the volume, you will not lose ROI. You're just going to get more of that good traffic, you know, and, and I love that when you find something sweet and you can just say, okay, crank it, turn the budget up to 10 K let's go and know that you're going to get, get the same results. It's a really nice feeling. Um, and also it doesn't burn out as quickly. You know, really I had campaigns on Taboola that I would set up, optimize for a little bit, let's say two weeks, three weeks, find my publishers, set it up. And then just refresh the images like once a week, once every two weeks, and not even fresh images, just the same images, fresh upload, trick the ad server a little bit with some impressions, get it kind of moving again. And it would just keep making cash every day. And I can't say hmm. I've gotten to that point with Facebook that I'm not like having to check on Facebook a lot, you know? So I, re yeah. I really like the consistent uh, money-making possibilities of natives. 
Nice. Well, we, we won't, won't, won't go into too much depth yet because we haven't set a date exactly, but we will be working together on a native ad masterclass so people can uh, make sure to subscribe at iStack Training and, uh, and, and keep their eyes out for that because everything that we've been able to do for Pops and now that we're doing for Facebook and the masterclass, uh, we're going to be doing for, for native as well in, uh, it's still in 2017 here. So I'm super excited for that. Um, yeah, I'm pumped. I, I'm super pumped about that. Cause I got my system. So in place, it's like, I could really give people the formula step one, step two, step three, step four. It's like super systematic on natives. There's very little guessing. So I'm excited to kind of break that off, um, and, and help people out with that. Cause I really do have a love for natives. So I'm excited for people to check that out. Very cool. So last question here. Uh, you know, we, I brought this up in, the, in my last couple podcasts. Uh, you know, one of the reasons that we're driven to succeed in affiliate marketing and just driven to win is the what I like to call the peak experiences that it affords us. These peak travel experiences. Like, what what do you you know? You don't seem you're not you're not you're not wearing Hugo Boss suits anymore. Uh, I don't know if you have a Roly. I didn't see a Roly on there. Uh, but what what are peak experiences to you at this point in your life that that you are looking that that, that are sort of enabled? Like, obviously, family. Obviously your wife, obviously things like that, but what are the peak experiences that drive you to kind of continue to win in this business? Yeah, I mean, really, I think as I mentioned, like um, I'll give you an example that kind of illustrates both discipline and uninterrupted time for myself. Um, after I shut down the call center, started generating leads, started making some pretty good money, started working with my partner now, and I was in Argentina, I was living in Buenos Aires, but I was in the south, 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 basically at the South Pole, Patagonia, and there are glaciers there. Um, I got a hostel there, $8 a night, uh, just just enjoying on the low, low, like money didn't matter at all, just I'm going to enjoy the experience. And um, I went out on a glacier, you know, you take a boat out there, you get the, the, the ice boots, the ice picks, and you go out into the middle of this glacier, you know, and, and I hiked out there, and they made us a cocktail with like million year old ice, you know, they just chip away ice cubes. <laughs> so you're, you're drinking a drink made with ice cubes that are super old. Um, and it was completely in, in, uninterrupted. But at the same time, when I got back to the hostel um, and I hadn't checked anything, I hadn't checked stats, I hadn't talked to anybody, whatever, logged in and I made like over 15K. And I think this, 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 <laughs> I was thinking like, yo, I'm paying $8 a night at this, just, you know, piece of trash hostel in Argentina, yeah. you know, and I'm just thinking like, I, you know, I was staying in the bunk, bunk bed room, you know what I mean? I wasn't even in a private room. I was in the bunk beds with all these people, which made it like this sweet, super sweet victory. And um, I was, I was just thinking, you know, it's like the business was able to run itself and make a bunch of money, which allowed me to have uninterrupted time. It didn't give me a bunch of money to pop bottles or, 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 you know, buy new cars or anything, but it allowed me to to go experience something without being interrupted for an entire day and still make money at the same time. Um, and I really like when those things happen. That's really like, I like it when I can enjoy my time and my business that I've spent a lot of time, money and building, and I've made it stable. So it's still making money for me while I, while I get this time benefit. And uh, that's really what I do it for at this point. That makes perfect sense. That illustrates, yeah, your your sort of personality, what you've built here, super well. Um, that's awesome, James. Thank you so much for coming on the podcast today. Totally. Uh, people, uh, you know, J James is going to be a big part of Ice Stack Training coming up. He's uh, you can catch him on FBML the recordings. You should check out uh, FBML Asia on IceStackTraining.com because you can now buy tickets on on our website for our Bangkok event. Uh, he's producing an acceleration module for the Facebook Masterclass on testing. Uh, and you know, and then the, the, the native masterclass, which we're going to be working on later in the year. Uh, super exciting. If people want to get in touch with you, what do you recommend? And, and also what plugs do you have? Yeah. I mean, okay. First off on the plug side, purple leads, we got the best offers in the game, hands down, uh, providing lookalike data, landing pages, whatever you need to get it going. And I think it's something that, you know, purple leads is me and it comes, you know, I'll tie it in with my contact information and everything, but it's just important for anybody who checks this stuff out. I love this shit. I live and breathe media buying, Facebook, native, Legion, Ecom. You know, this is, this is one of my passions. So I do like to talk shop. I like to find nuggets in every conversation that I have. If it's an expert to a noob, it doesn't really matter to me. You know what I mean? So you can hit me up on Facebook, Facebook messengers where most people reach out to me. Um, okay. and, and that's cool for me, but yeah, hit me up and check out like these courses and stuff. Like I really, 
Um, I believe in it. You know, I, I enjoy it. I'm passionate about it. It's something I do every single day. I enjoy teaching my team. You know, every morning in the conference room I'm sitting in right now, we got a morning meeting that's about learning. You know, I make my team yep. watch a video on learning every single day. Um, and, and, and I enjoy learning with them and I enjoy teaching. So it's like, look, if you got questions or whatnot, you know, reach out to me and uh, hit me up. Or if you got ideas, whatever, let's just, you know, talk shop and learn a little bit about uh, media buying. You know, I, I really enjoy it. So that's my plug. That's awesome. That's what I love about iStack training. What we're trying to do here is there's a lot of gurus in this space that are like, hey, implement my system for 20K overnight and blah, blah, blah. But everyone that we like to work with recognizes that this is a long term business take some discipline, uh, but there are systems that can allow you to reach incredible heights. So I think I think you're a perfect uh, fit with the iStack team. Uh, so anyways, thanks again today. Uh, enjoy the rest of your evening and we'll talk again soon. Thanks, buddy. Be cool. Okay. Bye-bye. See you, JMG, too. Bye.